I'm Mary Gwen Wheeler with 55,000 Degrees, here to welcome you and just get us started and let you know uh, about the day and what we're here about. You know, at a time when uh, every, all the research is telling us the uh, difference it makes to have uh, a college degree and some post-secondary education at the, and that uh, high school is not the end line uh, anymore, it's a really great opportunity to uh, share with you today some information in this open data, uh, open transparency of data world uh, that help us uh, come together around what we can do to ensure all students have that opportunity and that we have uh, the workforce for the 21st century uh, that our state, uh, commonwealth, and uh, city uh, need. So uh, let me just tell you a little bit about today. <clears throat> We're going to get a little context uh, from uh, Dr. Hargens, who will welcome you here to this building as well, who's the superintendent of Jefferson County Public Schools. Then uh, the state perspective uh, from Dr. Holliday, Commissioner of Education. Then we'll be uh, looking at the actual report. You've heard about a release of a report. It's an interactive online diagnostic tool that lets us look at that data and uh, Meg Nipson will be uh, of the Harvard Strategic Data Project will be sharing that. With that, I think, and uh, no further ado, I will introduce Dr. Donna Hargens, Superintendent Jefferson County Public Schools. Thank you. Welcome to Jefferson County Public Schools and to the Gaines Academy. This is really a great type of announcement. It's not a new program or a new school, but it's about a new educational tool, a type of report that will provide many benefits, not only for schools and districts, but for students throughout the state. It is a tool that will help students ultimately go to college. So I wanna commend the work of the sponsors for today's event. Of course, the Kentucky Department of Education, the Pritchard Committee for Academic Excellence, 55,000 Degrees, and the Harvard Center for Education Policy Research. This is a new interactive web-based report that will help us understand our, and improve our understanding of college readiness and college enrollment among Kentucky public high school graduates. At JCPS, we've focused a lot of time and attention over the past three years on college and career readiness. And we've doubled our rates from 32% in 2011 to 60.5% in 2014. And much of our success is due to the hard work that's happening in schools every day, from college access resource teachers to ACT prep programs and interventions, and to our real-time college readiness dashboard. Now we're on the right path, we know what to do to get our students college ready. So we know that we have to alleviate barriers. And we know that when they enroll, that we have to make sure that they attend college. In 2013, 20% of our graduates who intended to go to college did not enroll in college. So JCPS is working to address what we're calling summer melt. We've launched several initiatives and campaigns to combat this summer melt. Let me just tell you about a new uh, couple of them. One of them is text nudges. Every student has been able to sign up for text reminders and words of encouragement to keep them on track for college. If students indicated they were going to one of the top 20 schools that our kids go to, they even got institution-specific messages. Then there's jump the Jefferson Mentor Program connecting grads planning to attend JCTC with a near peer mentor who helped ease the transition to college. Students in the program also participated on on-campus networking events. Summer Coaches Program, high school graduates planning to attend a local college were able to partner with a summer college coach who checked in with them and helped them complete tasks. This new college going re report is gonna make our efforts even better. And it's gonna make our efforts to boost college and career readiness even better because it's a tool that will ultimately answer such questions as, what are the main challenges that our students face as they go to college? What obstacles keep students, especially low income students, from both enrolling and remaining in college? 
How can education and community leaders like those assembled today build an educated workforce by getting more students to and through higher ed programs that match their aspirations and their abilities? These are critical questions for every school system to answer. And this report will give us significant new insights. And I'm going to have Mary Glenn come back and introduce our next speaker. But I would be remiss if I didn't thank Commissioner Holliday for his service to the Commonwealth of Kentucky and his support of the Jefferson County Public School System. So I'll turn it back to Mary Glenn, who'll do an official introduction. Thank you, Dr. Hargens, and it is also my special pleasure as a, uh, also a member of the Kentucky Board of Education uh, to introduce the Commissioner of Education, Dr. Terry Holliday, who uh, uh, we will be missing uh, as he uh, moves into retirement uh, here at the end of the month. But again, I'll add my thanks, too, for your service, and he'll share with you again some uh, why this tool can be so important to us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor Gwen, and thank you, Donna. It's always delightful to be in Jefferson County. I think as I look over the last six years, Jefferson County is certainly a model for how districts can uh, come together and work together under strong leadership of Dr. Hargens and the board and uh, the mayor uh, to focus on college readiness for all children and to make significant improvements. If you look at the history in Kentucky the last uh, six years or so, the uh, higher education community and the K-12 community came together under uh, Senate Bill 1. Uh, the General Assembly had a great idea with Senate Bill 1, but what made Senate Bill 1 work was collaboration across Kentucky. Our good friends Jay Box and Bob King uh, in higher ed there working closely with K-12 community and the great partners like Pritchard Committee, Kentucky Chamber of Commerce, and uh, programs like uh, 55,000 Degrees here, here in uh, Louisville coming together to really focus on success for children. In a few weeks, you're going to hear a lot of test scores. Don't let the test scores uh, cloud the focus on the big picture. The big picture is do ch students graduate from high school? And if they graduate, are they ready to take the next step for college and career? Now, we have been uh, very privileged in Kentucky to have the higher education community come together and agree to set uh, external standards for college readiness. These standards are ACT, Compass, Coyote, uh, and uh, the career readiness measures of things like work keys, armed service, vocational aptitude, battery assessment, and uh, industry certifications. By having external measures, the public can be fairly well assured that the data are accurate, you can have confidence in the data, and you can have confidence that Kentucky education is improving in getting kids ready for the next step. As Dr. Hargens mentioned, the state has kept up uh, very similar to what Jefferson County has done. We moved from 34% of our kids graduating college ready in uh, 2010 to today. In a few weeks, we'll probably announce somewhere near 67%, which was our goal to be working on. Now, what does that mean for mom and dad? That means we've saved mom and dads and students about $15 million in uh, student loan debt uh, that they'd had to borrow to pay for non-credit bearing courses. What does that mean for the kids long term? That means that the students who are college ready return for their second year of college at a rate of 85% compared to low 60s of those students who are not college ready. Kids who are college ready, according to these measures, have a higher chance uh, of GPA. Their GPAs are like uh, 2.5 compared to uh, 1.6 of those students who are non-college ready. We know that the kids get more credit hours. 
21 credit hours for college ready versus about 11 credit hours for non-college ready. So these are real measures, these are real numbers, these are real students. And what this means is helping every student be successful at the next step. Now we can't be confident of this information unless we have a great data system. In 2012, we formed a strong partnership with the Strategic Data Fellows Program uh, through Harvard with the support of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and we were able to get two uh, data research uh, analysts, and now we're going to be uh, getting a replacement this fall, and they're focusing on things like the, the uh, college career readiness analysis, the human talent uh, resource pipeline management uh, work. They're focusing on helping close achievement gaps. So without the team of our delivery unit at KDE and our strategic data fellows, we would not be able to provide the information so that our state, our districts, and our schools can make data-informed decisions that will, in the end, help kids. Our delivery unit has a great motto. Says, we count kids because every kid counts. And that's what this is eventually about. While some of us get a little blurry about data every once in a while, the main thing is to remember, are kids graduating on time? Are they ready for the next step? And are they successful in college and careers once they begin that journey? So I'm delighted to uh, have this today as one of my last official activities. So uh, it's kind of where I started, transparency of data and using data to make great decisions for children. So thank you all for coming today. Thank you, Dr. Holliday. Next, uh, we will have a chance to actually look at the tool and the data. And let me introduce to you Meg Nipson, who's research manager for the Strategic Data Project at Harvard. She'll demonstrate the, the, web's, uh, the web report and uh, describe the questions and uh, interesting things that have been raised by the report. So, Meg. Hi, so as Dr. Holliday described, we've been working with the Kentucky Department of Education using data from the Kentucky Center for Education and Workforce Statistics for the last several years, both in the areas of human capital and college going. <coughs> Hi, is this better? Yes. Okay. <laughs> My apologies. Um, <coughs> and um, in terms of the work that we did on college going, we um, did a lot of analytics around um, the overall college going pathway, high school graduation, college enrollment, and college persistence, and we shared those analyses with um, KDE leadership. And then um, that work culminated in a series of nine um, regional reports that for nine regions in Kentucky where we, just, where we um, did analytics um, that were presented in, in half day workshops um, all through Kentucky and where we shared findings at the, um, at the high school level. And then finally, rather than writing a final report, we decided that we should do this interactive web report that I'm going to share with you today that's being released today. It's brand new and out there. You can all go and look it up. At, you can see the um, URL at the top of the screen. <coughs> um, so that users would have a chance to dive a little deeper into, into our findings. And um, one of the, before I get started, one of the points that I want to make is that this is not intended to be an accountability tool. Um, in some cases, we're looking back in time because we want to see how cohorts of ninth graders from the past have fared as they've progressed through high school and into college. So some of the, so, um, and also um, we fully expect that this tool will raise a lot more questions than it answers. And our goal is actually to encourage edu educators to go and, you know, to develop hypotheses and to pursue additional investigations to figure out what might be happening at a given school or what are the challenges that students are <coughs> facing um, who are in a particular environment or a particular group of students. So the idea here is not to sort of, um, you know, to, to think about accountability, much more to think about questions and um, using data to drive um, 
wise policy decisions and improve student achievement. Okay, so that said, I'll get started. And our website has four sections, the college going pathway, high school graduation, college enrollment, and college persistence. Each of these sections has one to three interactive figures. I'm just going to share three figures with you today because I think they're ones that are most likely to spark some policy discussion, um, but it'll also give you a sense for how the website works. So let's start off with this look at the college going pathway. And this shows a group of first-time ninth graders in the 2008-9 cohort and how they progressed all the way th um, through high school into college and through, the, and through the second year of college. So you can see here, this is for all of the students in Kentucky for the full cohort. And you can see that of um, every 100 ninth graders in this group, 82 graduated on time in four years. Of those, 45 seamlessly enrolled in college the fall after their graduating year, and 34 of them persisted into the second year of college. So there are a couple of things that I think are useful to think about with this um, report. One is the importance of thinking longitudinally, looking back in time and seeing how a given cohort of students fared. It's good to keep in mind, particularly as Kentucky has been seeing a lot of improvements and um, focusing a lot on college and career readiness in recent years, that when you're thinking about a a policy reform, one of the things you want to think about is how long has a given group of students been exposed to that change in the educational environment. <clears throat> um, and another thing that I think that this particular chart, we call it a waterfall chart, is useful for in terms of, of thinking about the data is thinking about how characteristics of different groups of students might affect their path through the, you know, um, path through the college going pipeline. So before I focus on that latter question, I want to show you some of the interactive features of the website. These features are available on all of the charts, but I'll just show it for this one so to avoid repetition. First of all, we can, for each of these, each of our web charts, pick any high school in Kentucky and um, show outcomes for that high school. So for example, here you can see that there are, you know, there are hover over, there's hover over information talking a little bit about the school and there are and there are um, results available for all schools. Um, also, each chart is accompanied by some text, first, which explains how to interpret the figure, and second, which explains how to take advantage of some of the interactive features of the figure. And in the text, there are readily available definitions for the terms that are used. And then, finally, each of the charts sh shows more than one outcome for a given group of students. So in this case, I've shown you this statewide average, and I've also shown you that you can see um, results for particular schools. But we can also take a look at all students in the state, but break them down differently. And this is sort of what I was referring to about how important it is to keep in mind the you know, not the makeup of a given group of stu students or, you know, the, the local context that particular schools <clears throat> have, not just sort of top line numbers. And I think that's, I hope, one of the big takeaways today. Thanks. Um, okay, so here what I'm showing is two lines, and the top red line shows the college going pathway for students who are not eligible for free and reduced price lunch. And the bottom blue line shows the college going pathway for this cohort of students, these 2009 freshmen, who were eligible for free and reduced price lunch, which is a common proxy for poverty. And you can see that there's a big difference here. Um, students who were not FERPL eligible enrolled in college at a rate of 64% seamless enrollers, um, whereas only one in three who were FERPL eligible. Um, enrolled for this cohort. Okay, next I'd like to take a look at another sort of student characteristic that is independent of students' high school experience, um, and that is thinking about prior achievement and academic preparedness when students enter high school. So here we've taken the same cohort of ninth graders and we divided them into four groups based on their eighth grade KCCT math scores, so four equally sized groups. Um, so this gives, this is sort of a proxy for how academically prepared these students are before they got into high school. And what you can see is that the trajectory along the college going pathway is very different for these groups. Um, students who were in the top quartile here in blue, who were in the top quarter of their eighth grade class in terms of math, almost three quarters of them enrolled seamless, seamlessly in college after graduating on time. Whereas for students in the bottom quartile, only one in five did so for this group of students. 
So obviously the sto story doesn't end here. You want to know a couple more things. You want to know, well, what happened to these kids after the second year of college? We're giving you the most recent data that we have available for college persistence here, but you want to track these guys further. And similarly, you want to know what happens with later cohorts. So this is just sort of a starting point. I think it's important to think about these groups of students over time, but it's also important to keep asking more questions and keep doing more analyses. Okay, so that chart kind of gives you an overall look, but next I'd like to take a look specifically at a figure that addresses college readiness issues. <clears throat> and so what I'm going to do here is I'm looking at a figure that the outcome that's shown right now is high school graduation. This is the average rate of on-time high school graduation for um, first-time ninth graders. And um, each dot here represents a high school. And you can see that we're looking at two cohorts, the 2009-10 um, and 2010-11 ninth graders. <clears throat> and each, each dot here is a school. And the height of the dot represents the on-time high school graduation rate for that school. And then the location of the dot along the axis here at the bottom represents the average academic preparedness in terms of eighth grade math score for, for that school. So here, so essentially we're giving you two pieces of information. We're saying how ready were the students when they got to high school and what share of them graduated on time. And as you would expect, there seems to be a bit of relationship. In general, there's an upward trend um, <coughs> excuse me, um, schools with students who are more prepared tended to have higher graduation rates. But that trend isn't really all that strong. There's sort of a cloud of schools. Many schools in Kentucky seem to be graduating their students on time regardless of their level, level of incoming preparation. And that's, so the question is, is that a good thing? It doesn't seem like a bad thing. Um, but I want to show you another outcome, uh, college readiness. And so here's the college readiness outcome for the same schools. It's the same basic setup. We have schools average incoming math performance for eighth graders for the students in their student body. Um, if you can think back to the first chart, you'll remember that, that you know, incoming achievement does seem to matter a, f a great deal in terms of college going success. Um, and, um, and he, but here on the left-hand side, we're looking at the share of students who were college ready. And I want to just explain, first of all, that we're, remember we're looking back in time. And also, this is not the KDE college readiness um, metric. Here we are just using a simplified metric um, based on ACT scores. And we're using a metric, the CPE metric, that basically says we're classifying kids using this simplified metric as college ready if they scored at least 18 in English, 19 in math, and 20 in reading. Um, if students are missing um, an ACT score, for example, because they dropped out or perhaps for some other reason, we're counting them in, as not college ready. And it's also entirely possible that a number of the students included in this sample went on to achieve a college readiness benchmark through um, ACT Compass or Coyote. So, and of course, ACT is just one you know, just one metric that you can use to think about college readiness. But still, at the same time, you can see that there is a gap um, between students, schools that are graduating, um, most students on time, and this, this particular metric of college readiness. And you can also see that, you know, incoming achievement seems to matter quite a bit. You can see this fairly strong upward sloping trend. So this is just something to, and you would expect that as education reforms take hold, that this gap will decrease. Um, but knowing that it's there is, you know, sort of an inspiration for an ongoing patient and committed focus on college, on college readiness. So I'm going to show you one more chart in the college enrollment section. And this chart doesn't directly address college access, but I think it raises some interesting questions about college access. Um, and by college access, I mean things like, you know, the availability of financial aid or support getting through that period where summer melt is a risk or just knowledge about navigating the college going process overall, the, the kinds of issues that 
um, the initiatives Dr. Hargens was um, describing are intended to address. <clears throat> okay, so let me let me start out. So again, this this doesn't talk about college access. This chart doesn't talk about college access directly, but I think it is a good starting point for conversations. Um, so first, I'll unpack the chart. Um, <coughs> This looks like a big blue blob, but it's actually a whole bunch of really skinny bars, one for each high school in Kentucky, and we've sorted those bars in order of increasing um, college enrollment, seamless college enrollment rates, and there's one bar for each high school in Kentucky. And, you know, if we wanted to, we could look separately at rural and urban and independent counties. Um, or we could look up a particular school or select a particular school. Um, <coughs> And when I'm talking about college enrollment rates, we're using the National Student Clearinghouse, um, which you consider, which is the best data that's currently available. You can con you can consider that, you know, it's it's as accurate as we can make it. Um, although, you know, it, there there might be reasons why it was a slight underestimate. Um, okay, but however, remember that I said looking at the top line numbers doesn't really give you anything you can take action on or it doesn't, it doesn't give you more information about what kind of challenges you're facing or what, how you want your policy conversation to go. So instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at um, <coughs> another, um, the data in another way. <coughs> Here I'm taking the data and I'm dividing these students um, who, are, um, who are high school graduates. I'm, I'm taking this college enrollment not as a share of ninth graders but as a share of high school graduates. Um, in the 2012 and 2013 graduating classes. And I'm just, and here I'm ca comparing apples with apples. So I'm saying, let's look at all the students who were in the bottom quartile, the bottom quarter of their class in eighth grade math before they got into high school. And let's compare all the different schools just for that group of students. And then similarly, let's look at different schools, um, but just for the group of students who were in the top quarter of their, um, of their classes for eighth grade math before they got to high school. And you can see a couple of things here. First of all, as you might expect, um, the um, top quartile students have overall much higher college enrollment rates than the bottom quartile students. But, um, and, but there are some exceptions. There are some cases where there are some top quartile, some schools that have lower top quartile college enrollment rates than other schools do bottom quartile. Um, college enrollment rates. But I think one of the main takeaways here, and the reason I said I think this starts a good conversation about college access, is the fact that if you look at the top quartile, there is a very large range in terms of college enrollment rates for students who are essentially similar in terms of their academic preparation. Um, you know, you would generally expect that students who are in the top quartile of their classes in eighth grade math, assuming that college, that high school went relatively well for them, they should be able to apply and be accepted and enroll in college. And so the question is, what are the local differences that are causing differences in local outcomes? It could be, you know, it could be, um, you know, economic factors, it could be different expectations, it could be, you know, obviously there's more than, kids can do more than just go to college, although college is generally a pretty good bet overall. Um, but the thing is that it almost looks as if there's sort of a missing triangle here. It, this seems like lo almost low-hanging fruit. If these, if, they're, if these are local differences and you can kind of ask the right questions and figure out what interventions would make a difference, um, this is kind of a target of opportunity. Um, and then finally, I just want to show you that the picture, because JBox is here, um, the, the picture is somewhat different for two-year colleges. I was looking at all colleges before, but here you can see that um, two-year colleges have a very different enrollment pattern than looking at all colleges or just four-year colleges because um, there's a heavier weighting of bottom quartile students in two-year colleges. Um, okay, so I'm going to stop there because I know we have a packed schedule. I do want to mention, however, before I finish that there are a couple of other people from my team here today. Dan Thal, if you can, um, did a lot of the programming of the interactive graphics, and I encourage you to ask him a whole lot of really difficult technical questions and put him on the spot. Um, 
We also have Nick Morgan here, who is the executive director of the Strategic Data, Data Project, and he would be very happy to answer questions about our, over, our overall diagnostic engagement. And John Fullerton, the director of the Center for Education Policy Research, um, will be actually on um, the second panel today talking about kind of the being a researcher voice when we're um, for the conversation about the policy implications of this work. And I also want to mention um, Lauren Dolan and Kate Clank, who are back in Cambridge. They're not here, but they also worked very hard on this project, and I'm very proud of the work that they did. Uh, yeah, does anybody have any questions? You've referenced several times freshman mm -hmm. class of 2009. Does that mean most of the data? I wasn't mm -hmm. really ready for math in eighth grade, so I'm figuring that's the class of 2013. Mm, yeah, uh, tw 12. Am I right? Add 3, yeah. 9, 10, 11, 12. So the graduating class of 2012. And incoming freshmen in fall of 09. No, fall of 08. Oh, okay. So when I'm saying 2009, I'm using the spring. So most of the data on the site currently is uh, high school graduating class of 2012. Actually, it's, it's an interesting combination. Typically what we do is we use the two most recent cohorts that we can use. So for persistence, uh, so for high school graduation, we're using the class of 2014. For college enrollment, we're using the class of 2013. And for persistence analyses, we're using the class of 2012. Well, given the, the superintendent's point and Dr. Holliday's point of, of the significant growth in college and career readiness within Kentucky, mm -hmm. just over a relatively short period of time, is, is this information timely enough? Um, well, it's the most recent information that exists, and I think the point that I'm trying to make is so, so the reason that we're tying it back so far is we really want to, uh, you know, kind of hold harmless high schools in terms of the mix of students that they're receiving. So we, we really want that eighth grade test score. What I would encourage is to, this is, you know, is to continue doing the analytics every year so that you can verify that improvement, um, both looking at just this simplified measure of college, re of college readiness, for example, and the more complex measure. So it's definitely not, I think that's a very fair, um, you know, uh, a very fair critique, sort of balancing the, the, the need for kind of a long-term and patient look at, at the data and the policy and sort of digging in and, 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 and making changes over a longer period of time versus the need to, for people to be able to celebrate recent recent victories. I'm just wondering if I'm a high school principal and, and my data over the last couple of years has been significantly better than mm -hmm. the data on this site, yet people, are, consumers are going to the site making decisions about high school selection. He should tell them to call me. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay. Please thank Meg.